I'm Indy Nidell. And I'm Pierre from Sabaton, and you're watching Sabaton History Channel. You think, when you think of Sabaton talking about epic battleships, you probably think Bismarck. But, but wait, wait, wait. But, Pierre, we already did an episode about, about Bismarck. What could this episode be about? Dreadnought. Yeah. When you picture a battleship, what do you imagine, huh? A sleek gray giant making her way through the waves with unstoppable force, dark plumes of smoke trailing after her as the bow smashes through the water, mighty batteries of the largest guns known to man while also being protected by a belt of steel plates. Well, if the answer is yes, then you might have just imagined a dreadnought. 1916, the end of May. The Great War had seen a few large naval battles so far, but nothing like what was about to come. A storm was brewing on the North Sea as two mighty battle lines approached each other with deadly intent. Both the British Royal Navy's Grand Fleet and the Imperial German High Seas Fleet brought armadas of fearsome battle cruisers and deadly destroyers into the fray, and among them, the mightiest battleships the ocean had ever seen, the Dreadnoughts. In the early 20th century, British naval planners around First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher brainstormed about the battleship of the future. Their general view on naval engagements was quite simple. In an open battle on the high seas, where both sides enjoyed equal levels of vision and marksmanship, the vessel that could fire heavier shells at a longer range than its enemy would ultimately win the engagement. Much of his thinking was influenced by the Battle of Tsushima of May 27, 1904. Here, it was Japanese battleships that had forced the engagement onto the Russian Navy at a range of over 7,000 yards. Firing their 12-inch guns at a battle speed of 21 knots, Admiral Togo's vessels had the advantage over the Russians. His total victory strengthened the belief that overwhelming firepower, range, and speed were the key to winning on the high seas. Fisher planned for a revolutionary battleship design that was to embody this martial philosophy. The new Dreadnought was to become the unchallenged champion of the high seas, faster, stronger, tougher than anything else. The shadow moves across the water in pursuit. It splits the waves, commands the sea, and defies the wind. They began with firepower and range. The previous generation of heavy battleships were usually outfitted with four 12-inch guns supported by gun batteries of smaller caliber. Having such a mixed battery allowed the battleship to be flexible when reacting to threats at different ranges, but Fisher wanted to get rid of this defensive mindset. His dreadnought committee argued that such a mix was not beneficial to the battleship, as different sized guns would need to be calibrated for different angles, trajectories, and velocities. Instead, the dreadnought was to be solely outfitted with the giant 12-inch guns. Secondary armament of 9.2 or 6-inch guns was meaningless to Fisher, as the dreadnought would fight its battles way out of their range anyway. The benefits of a devastating 12-inch gun salvo would beat any perceived flexibility any day. Because of this mixed array of guns of different calibers, naval battles had often been fought at around three to 4,000 yards of range, so that smaller eight and six inch guns could be brought to bear on the enemy as well. Fisher, however, wanted the engagement to be fought at 6,000 yards or more, a range where only the largest 12 inch guns were effective. Any lesser armed ship would be destroyed before it got in range to fire back. It was calculated that if the dreadnought brought its broadside to bear, then six, later eight, guns could throw 6,800 pounds of high explosives and armor-piercing steel at the enemy's deck. With modern fire control systems, this would absolutely annihilate even the heaviest battleship of its time, as no amount of armor could safeguard against such firepower. The next component was speed. Superior speed would be both the Dreadnought's sword 
and its shield. When a captain could choose to engage and disengage at will, he could force time and place of battle on his adversary. Out on the oceans, there's no real cover a ship can hide behind, other than maybe darkness or, or fog. A ship can't simply slip back into safety when spotted. Once engaged, the faster vessel could overtake and, and destroy the slower one. Fisher envisioned the dreadnought achieving 21 knots, but its size and its weight made that impossible. Pushed to their limits, the standard reciprocating steam engines could maybe achieve a max battle speed of 19 knots. But even that was limited. The heavy pistons inside the cylinders would eventually shatter. They'd break under such stress. The solution came with the invention of the turbine engine, which ran via steam being pressed against the blades of revolving discs. And it revolutionized the engine room. Turbine engines were comparatively clean too, created little noise or vibration, and most importantly, they gave the dreadnought the speed Fisher wanted. Its 17,000 tons were easily moved by a 23,000 horsepower engine. The third component was armor. Now, superior speed and firepower are defensive in their own right, but having a good old belt of steel armor to fall back on when the shells are bursting is even better. The designers called for a thick skin of 5,000 tons of armor distributed around the ship. Each dreadnought's armor belt below the waterline had to be strong enough to withstand at least two torpedo hits. The battleship's insides were safeguarded by watertight, self-contained compartments with no horizontal exits. Many reckoned that the dreadnought would be unsinkable. A direct hit would, most likely, doom men trapped inside. But the ship was not to be sunk by a single hole in the armor. If need be, the dreadnought would just power through the enemy's fire. Fisher stated his doctrine of how dreadnoughts were to be used best in battle. Once the enemy fleet was encountered, the dreadnoughts would use their greater speed and greater range, or larger guns, to best effect. They would remain untouched, staying out of range of the lighter guns of their enemies. And once the enemy turned to escape an, an unwinnable situation, the dreadnoughts would pursue and destroy at their own leisure from afar. As long as the dreadnoughts adhered to that principle, they would be untouchable. In 1906, HMS Dreadnought was officially launched at sea. The name actually comes from the first Dreadnought, launched all the way back in 1573. At that time, Queen Elizabeth wanted the British Royal Navy to show the world, quote, how little she dreaded, and how little such a people could dread the mightiest armaments of their enemies, while the battle for their liberties was to be fought on such an element as the ocean. So once more, this was to be embodied in a revolutionary battleship. And revolutionary this overall redesign truly was. The dreadnought shone with modern simplicity and standardization. Gone were the relics of the past, like, like the edged ram bow at the forefront. Battle stations were streamlined. Officers' quarters were put inside the bridge and the commander directed from the conning tower. All in all, the new dreadnought was worth two or maybe even three older battleships. Everything else seemed now to be inferior and outdated by comparison. In 1907, the Dreadnought went to sea for target practice. At 8,000 yards, it fired 40 rounds and scored 25 hits. This in itself was impressive, but it was not so much the number of hits that was so impressive, it was the amount of destructive weight each successful hit created. In a barrage of under eight minutes, the Dreadnought was able to deliver more than 21,000 pounds of shells onto an enemy battleship. Nothing could withstand that. There were, though, some valid criticisms of this new revolutionary design coming from within the British Navy. At the time of the Dreadnought announcement, Britain possessed the largest fleet on the planet and the strongest armada of pre-dreadnought battleships. But now, with the most powerful vessel in history being released from the dry dock, all those advantages in numbers suddenly became way less meaningful. In fact, 
the new standard of battleships gave Britain's potential future enemies a new chance to compete with the Royal Navy on equal footing. First among them was the Imperial Fleet of Germany, which of course began building dreadnought-like ships of its own. Many denounced this new arms race of monster warships as unnecessary and extremely dangerous for world peace. But progress was irreversible, and soon every seagoing nation wanted to build their own dreadnoughts. But heck, even the dreadnoughts' original planners were already thinking of the next step in battlefield evolution. What if they got rid of silly constraints like, like size or budget altogether? Why not go beyond what Fisher had designed in his original dreadnought design and build super dreadnoughts, huh? Yeah, the Orion class, which emerged only a couple years later, had even mightier guns, thicker armor, more powerful engines. These new monster warships were named Monarch, Thunderer, and Conqueror. The only question left in the back of everyone's head was, how would they actually perform in battle? Well, this question would one day be answered. On May 30th, 1916, roughly a decade after its launch, the dreadnoughts headed out to meet their foes. In the rough waters of the North Sea, towards the Skagerrak and Jutland, British and German battleships made ready to bring their mighty guns to bear and hurl tens of thousands of pounds of shells onto each other. The building of HMS Dreadnought was indeed a revolution in battleship design. The uniform main battery, the steam turbines, the power to weight ratio, it all led to the most powerful gunships the world had ever seen. But would Fisher's prophecy come true? Would the dreadnoughts annihilate their opposition and reign as unopposed rulers over the high seas? Well, if Sabaton ever writes a song about the Battle of Jutland, we'll find out. Okay, Per, just straight off, how did this song come to be? All right, I'm actually sitting not so far away from here, probably maybe, let's say, 50 meters away from where we're sitting right now, okay. in our warehouse, uh -huh. and uh, Joachim is working on a song 50 meters away from me. Just the music? or, or yeah, the yeah. music. And then he comes over to me and says, hey, listen to this. Uh, how do you think about it? And I say... Great, Joachim, you wrote a Swedish båtlåt. You know, and for anybody who doesn't <laughs> understand what båtlåt is. It's a boat song, a boat song, a, yeah. a song about boats and stuff. Uh, wait, can we hear just the first opening bars just so see if anybody gets that? I bought some salt. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what yeah, is uh, this? So I, I'm, I'm telling Joachim because he looks a little bit confused. What do you mean båtlåt? Are you ma making a joke out of me? And I'm like, uh, actually, no. You hear what the song is about. And this is such a clear thing. It's about a heavy ship at sea, rocking. You can, you can feel it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm with and, you. And he was like, mm, I don't really get it where it fits in. You know, this is perfect. We are now writing a song about World War I. Here we have a ship song. And what kind of ship was the most badass ship of the Great War? The Dreadnoughts, the Super Dreadnoughts. So there we go. And what is a cooler title than Dreadnought? Nothing. Exactly. No, nothing. That's why the It's song even cooler is than not. Bismarck, <laughs> yeah, <it laughs> which is. is the wrong war, but still. Yeah. Now, I, I really enjoy this song because, again, it, this is a, I like the ones you know, that I feel are a bit different, you know, like a march to the beat of a different drummer, I guess. No offense, Hannes, but uh, <laughs> march to the beat of a different drummer. Now, you guys have traveled the world, you tour around a lot, and you still take time to go to historical sites and locations when you travel, as, as we all know. We've, We've been there together. Been there together. <laughs> but have you ever, I mean, I don't know how many dreadnoughts or super dreadnoughts there actually are still left existing today. Have you ever been on an actual dreadnought? Or? I know that there is at least one existing. Okay. And I haven't been there yet. Okay. And what's that? <laughs> it's the one named after the state where you come from. The Battleship Texas? Yes. Oh, uh, 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 get the f I've grown up knowing the Battleship Texas. I mean, since I was a kid. Three times between kindergarten and 12th grade, I had to go with my school 
to visit the battleship Texas. I didn't think then that this is a dreadnought class or, uh, but, but of course it is. It's, the, it's a First World War battleship. See, you guys, that's why this channel is important to me because I don't realize I put things together from my earlier life and stuff. So, uh, but you've never been to the battleship Texas? No, I never been to the battleship Texas, but we're going on a tour in America and um, we're actually gonna pass by. And this time, yeah, we're not gonna miss it. And I gotta notice something, I can't help but notice, and I didn't even notice until now during this filming, and this is honest to God, I did not see your hat until right now. Oh, that's something new that we... We're yeah. gonna have seven on history caps. Yeah, and this one is actually the first ever made. It's a prototype. Okay. Um, but we are working on uh, the final design of it. And, and if someone walks down the street and there's seven on history cap, it, it's like it increases their coolness like by 10, right? Uh, we all know from 90s commercials, the only way to increase your coolness is to pop a Mentos, right? <laughs> <laughs> you remember those commercials, right? All right, yeah. Do you remember the one that was like, it, it had to do with a rock band, right? The guy, there's a guy, he, ter he turned, he's standing next to a ticket office and there's a big sign that says, rock concert sold out and he's he's going blah, 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 to the woman behind the counter and she's like pointing up at the sign and he's like dang and he turns and looks around and he sees roadies pushing like some heavy equipment like through the stage entrance thinking quickly he um pops his mentos from his back pocket eats a mentos thus increasing his freshness factor by like 10 or something then takes out a bandana ties it around his head, and the next scene, you see him rolling like equipment, and, and the woman behind the counter goes like, ah, 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 and he gives her the Mentos salute. So. All right, so we can give some ideas. I mean, we get, often get emails from uh, fans all over the world who is wondering how they get a job as a roadie for Sabaton. Okay. Work. Well, Mentos already have the answer to that, <laughs> yeah, apparently. So, uh, <laughs> that would, I mean, that would totally work. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> do do, do <laughs> people ask you a lot about, about how they can work for you guys on tour? Yeah, we actually get a lot of those questions. And it's... Um, uh, we do often recruit people, but not from um, like from unknown places. Right. The, and you want people with experience. Yeah. In the general. community of uh, people who are working with bands yeah. is um, relatively small. Right. And we all know each other. And if you want to become a successful person working for a rock band or something or other artists around the world. It's the only, there's only one way to do it, and that is start from uh, start with the local bands, yeah, helping yeah, them out, up. and then work your way up. We eventually, as anybody else in uh, in any other rock band, would recruit off each other. Basically, sure. when when one band goes off touring and becomes idle for a while, there's uh, available people, and they go jump on with another band, and that's how it works. Okay. Hey, you know, who's uh, really, you know who's really cool to work with? And can we get a picture in here? Eddie. Eddie was cool to work with. So I just wanted to get a shout out to Eddie. That's Eddie. He's cool. I think that's probably all we have to talk about today, yeah. right? Para, you got to say goodbye to everybody because this is all for today. Yeah, so thank you everybody for watching. It's been a pleasure to talk about the Dreadnought and Mentos. And Mentos here on Sabaton History. See you next time. Thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. Please remember to click that little bell so that you get updates and notifications once we release new episodes.